Welcome back, honors. Welcome back, Chappelle. Welcome back to your first flip of the fourth quarter, which unfortunately I got to use a recycle one because I'm about to get pulled into a meeting real quick, but I got to make sure this thing's up in time. So honors can go ahead and start banging this out during S period and stuff like that. But we'll go ahead and talk about this stuff later on. This is a flip that I made during quarantine school last year. It's actually really, really solid. It's very, very good. There are certain times where you can kind of skip ahead a little bit and stuff like that, but it's actually not that bad. It's a really good flip. It's very comprehensive. Very good for your upcoming test, all right? So three other major reasons why Britain is the focal point of the Industrial Revolution. It's starting and it's in place, right? One, big first reason, they have huge deposits of coal and iron, right? So notice right here, right? You see all these little like indicators. So every little silver piece you see, that's a huge iron ore deposit. Every single coal, like, or every single little orange thing, those are big coal deposits, right? So Britain had a lot of coal and iron, which are the two materials that the Industrial Revolution depended on, right? They had to have coal and iron, right? You had to have coal to power the steam engines. You had to have iron to build the machines of which the engines themselves were built out of, right? So like, Iron and coal deposits are going to be huge. And then that's going to increase the need for railroads, right? Railroads are going to start popping up. And guess what machine or engine is going to power those rail, like those first locomotives? The steam engine, right? The very first one ever invented was invented by George Stevenson. It was called the rocket. Now, anyway, ironically enough, they tried to build a car out of a steam engine first. But they realized it was really dangerous to have somebody driving this vehicle. So the very first time they ever tried to take it out on the road, they ended up crashing it. So they actually then decided that it'd probably be a lot safer to put it on rails and not have to worry about the direction. So the railroads became a huge thing. But we, so we just said uh, coal and iron deposits is a big one. Second one is they had longer periods of peace slash they're an island, right? The big thing about being an island and having longer periods of peace, the longer periods of peace were because they were an island. They were separate from the continent while the French Revolution was occurring. While the continent of Europe was so swept up and all that stuff, Britain was able to stay separate. Also, them being an island and having an island-style economy, they are going to be able to have a huge naval fleet and a very large shipping force and huge areas for natural harbors that are going to give them the ability to take the products that are going to be made during this Industrial Revolution and ship them out all over the place. Speaking of, now is our third reason. Big third reason why Britain is the home to the Industrial Revolution is due to the fact of their colonial holdings. They had colonies everywhere. Not just the little where, everywhere. And Britain became the main supplier of textile, manufactured, factory-produced goods to all those colonies. So not only did they have a place to buy the raw materials from, like the cotton in India, or the sheep wool coming from Scotland and Ireland and Wales. Well, that's not the colony that's in their United Kingdom, but you understand what I'm saying. They now could process that cotton into cheap textiles using the water frame or the power looms that are going to be used by the steam engine and then sell it back to people in India for a cheaper price. Guess what the hot ticket item was whenever they were shipping? Guess what was coming? Like the Christmas of 1830, the big item that was under everyone's Christmas tree? Underpants. That's right. Great Britain invented underpants following the Industrial Revolution because they became cheap undergarments, right? Cheap ch cotton undergarments that could be worn under your clothes to keep your clothes on top from ever actually just getting tattered or sweat-soaked or stuff like that. By getting further into it, that's why it happened in Britain. It's an island with peacetime periods, huge coal and iron deposits, not to mention their huge colonial holdings. Now, I could keep making this list. I could keep going further and further. Big, massive investments business-wise. Uh, keep going further and talk about you know their naval fleet suppressing any revolts preventing colonial withholdings. Uh, I could go into it and say that the government in Britain specifically said to their engineers, do not sell our ideas into the continent. We keep them here. Lots of different reasons. But we got to talk big ones now about the effects of the Industrial Revolution. The big, big time effects. First and foremost, you got this thing called urbanization. Big question in your extension assignment that's going to be coupled with this flip is talking about the movement of people to cities. So people are going to start moving out of the countryside and into the cities. Because remember when we talked about the agricultural revolution, the enclosure movement, the seed drill, uh, what else? All this other stuff is going to free people up with extra time to work, and then that's going to cause the industrious revolution with the cottage industry where people are going to start making things in their houses, and those are kind of like the baby, the first baby size factories. 
Then they're going to start moving into actual factories due to the big inventions like the spinning jenny, the water frame, the flying shuttle. And then when the steam engine is created, they start making power looms. Those power looms start being put in factories in cities. So they can be closer to harbors and ports and also just other major railway stops, things like that. So massive numbers of people are going to start moving from rural areas out in the country and going all the way into the cities because there's a constant demand and need for factory workers as businesses began to grow. This right here is an image that you'll see in your extension assignment. That right there is known as back-to-back -back housing. That's where the workers live for the factories. All of these houses were like row homes. They had no real yards, but they had these courtyards in the back that they would share with another house that was on the other side. And the great thing was is there was access to like a well, right, better water. They could kind of wash, do their laundry and things like that together in big communal settings. But the back-to-back -back housing was also built because of this constant demand for factory workers. A great example city to look at is actually Manchester, United Kingdom, who, I don't know if y'all know this, but uh, Mr. Wooderson, big fan of the Manchester United Soccer Club that was started a little bit after this. Now, anyway, 17,000 people lived in Manchester, United Kingdom in 1755 before the big push for factories started being created. 40,000 people within 30 years, 70,000 people within 50 years. So as you can see, the population of these cities just keeps going up and up and up and up and up and up, and up, and up because of urban now, this is going to lead to a lot of negatives. No sewage system still, so you've got literally human waste sitting around in people's like backyards and in the streets. Some people actually try to sell it as fertilizer, which is disgusting. And then, not to mention the fact that you're also going to see easier spread of disease, things like that. But you'll see that in the extension assignment as well. All right, but let's keep going. Now, it's going to dramatically affect the, I'm going to move myself down here because I already talked about railroads a little bit. It's also going to dramatically affect the way that social classes were set up. The social classes are all going to change. The biggest social class setting that we saw out of European, the your, all of European history, the best one we can relate it to, is maybe the French Revolution with the bourgeois and the rural peasants. But that's because the feudal system was failing. Now remember, the final death stroke for the feudal system was the Industrial Revolution because it kind of just threw it all away and was like, this is the dumbest thing that we've ever done. It's just like this football. They're just like, get that out of here, right? So the feudal system's gone now. So what's it going to be replaced by? A new industrial social class system. The industrial social class system is going to have at the very, very tip top, the landowning class, the old feudal lords, right? They're going to have like farms, big, big areas outside of the cities, they're still going to own huge swaths of land and still be referred to in some cases as lords, which is absolutely insane. But then the next one down, there's a new class, and they're called the industrial middle class. This middle class of people was a lot like the bourgeois from France. They owned and operated private business. They had access to an education. They owned railroads. They owned factories. They were entrepreneurs because all this stuff is a singing testament to what big new economic system espoused by Adam Smith. What is it? Good job, Kaylee Roche. Capitalism. So the capitalism uh, system is really taking hold and people are beginning to jump in on it. They're like, oh, you're telling me I could open a brick building, shove a bunch of power looms in it, hire people to work them, and I can make buku money off of it? That's your entrepreneurs right there. Capitalism is having its major growth, right? Adam Smith always saw it coming. He's the money man, wealth of nations, right? Now, getting further into it, though, then we've got another class popping up. This other class popping up is known as the industrial working class. Those are the people that work for the industrial middle class. Those are the people that are usually very poor. Now, not at first. Not at first. At first, the industrial working class was very, very prosperous because these factory owners needed a way to entice people out of the country to come and work in these factories. And for a long time, it was a very, very hard thing to do because these factories were these big brick buildings that looked almost exactly like prisons. And a lot of people were very, very nervous about working in them. Um, so where do you think a lot of the early factory owners went and found their workers? Orphanages! Uh, they actually went to foundling hospitals and orphanages, and that's kind of where child labor got kicked off because they needed to find people to work, and nobody wanted to work in them because they're really big and scary. And going further with it, though, eventually the way you're going to entice people to work is you're going to pay them, right? You're going to pay them good. 
So what ends up happening is they pay pretty well early on, but as the years progress from like 1790 into 1800 into 1810 into 1820, wages start to do this thing called stagnate. They went ding, 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 and they kind of plateaued off. They stagnated out. This turned the industrial working class into a group of very poor people, who a lot of them lived in very foul-smelling apartments with no running water in these back-to-back -back houses systems. Some families as large as 20 would be living in like single-room apartments. So early on, this was amazing. But later, it's going to start getting much more worse, right? Much more worse? That's not even a phrase. All right, much worse. Now, not to mention the fact that now what we're going to be getting into is some of the conditions of these people, where they would work, the Industrial Revolution, how it's going to affect people's daily lives more than anything else. That's why my beautiful wife is asking you these amazing questions like, where did these first women sit and take their exams? Which is a monumental, amazing thing. But behind the veil of the Industrial Revolution being a progressive good thing, there were also some terrible, horrific things. One of those being the factories themselves. So factories in the early onset of the Industrial Revolution when they were all sitting next to waters and streams and they were out in the countryside and they were being ran by normal workers or people who just needed extra work and they would go in there and run a spinning jenny with their hand or they would just watch the water frame do its thing, maybe untangle the threads a little bit. It was fine. But factory conditions got a lot worse when they started attaching steam engines to these power looms and just started cutting out the people all together. And so now you've got these steam engines just going and just making, making cheap fabrics all the time, making all this stuff, punching it all out. What does a steam engine give off a lot of? Heat. Tons and tons and tons of heat. So these factories had no ventilation. They would just get crazy hot in the hundreds of degrees. People would pass out. It was very, very dangerous. They also had no windows or anything like light providing sources to help also vent out these uh, these big fumes that were coming off of the uh, the steam in or the steam engines and the power looms themselves. You also could end up working anywhere from 12 to 16 hours. And early on, they were like, look, come in and work 12 hours and I'll pay you per hour and you'll make good money. People were on it. But as time goes on, it's coming and work 12 hours, and if you refuse, I'm just going to hire somebody else, and you're going to be out of a job, and your family's going to starve. You pick. So, as you can see, the Industrial Revolution started out great, but then started getting really bad. Machines also, zero safety mechanisms, right? Quick story, my brother and I one time threw vegetables and fruit inside of our washing machine when we were little, and we got in a lot of trouble because it was raining outside, we were bored. So, like, there's a safety mechanism in your washing machine. It's a kill switch, right? There's a switch that if you, when you put the lid down, it'll, the, the spin cycle, kick back on. That's to keep any of y'all from sticking your hand in there or doing anything dumb. Now, this safety mechanism, we learned how to circumvent because it was like a little button. You could push down on it and it would kick back on. But these factory machines in the Industrial Revolution had none of those things, right? None of them. They had no safety mechanisms. So if you got caught inside of a power loom, you could have skin ripped off, hands broken, uh, legs possibly broken from falling fabric or falling things inside of your factory. It's very dangerous. And if you got hurt or got sick, you were fired, right? Let go. Done. They just figured, whatever, I'll just replace you like a gear in a machine. If you break, I'll just find a new one. So as you can see, these things get off really, really awful. Now, usually there was also a division of labor as well inside of these factories. Men typically were shoveling coal to power the steam engines that would power the factory machines. The women were oftentimes factory workers, right? So because they only had to kind of load things or move different items, and they then kind of were also paid about half as much as a man, which is very, very unfair. Children in the factories were used to untangle uh, the loom wires or the loom threads, which if it kicked back on and caught their hand, it could like break their hands and peel all the skin off their hands and things like that. Very, very dangerous for children. Or they would run around picking up scraps of cloth and stuff in these terribly dangerous factories. Now, the other place that you could end up working was the mines, right? Now, I know in the back of your mind, my, not in the back of your mind, not like you have a mine at your house, but I know that in the back of your mind, when you think of working in a mine, you see something like this. Hi-ho! 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 It's home from work we go! Hi-ho! 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 It's home from work we go! Well, in all 
actuality, working in a mine was nothing like that. Working in a mine was actually much more like this. What's his name? What's his name? I got nothing on a name. Come on, baby, what's the name? <laughs> So, as you can see, the mines are a very dangerous place to be. Not as you can see because Spongebob just told you they're dangerous. Spongebob's just representing the chaos that is working inside of these mines. You are very, very, very in a dangerous spot. The Industrial Revolution creates a higher demand for iron and coal, so they're going to start digging more mines. If you're digging more mines, you've got to pull this stuff out of the ground, you've got to hire more workers. Miners are going to be paid more, yes, but the conditions far more dangerous than that of a factory. You work in practical darkness, add these to this list, add these to this list. I have two of them on there, you should end up with about four or five. You have to work in practical darkness, coal dust causes a disease known as black lungs disease, right? You have to, uh, oh, it's extremely hot, you can pass out, you pass out down there, they don't find you, you're dead. Uh, mine cave-ins, explosions, uh, 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 harsh metal poisonings, lots of different things, but it could easily kill you. There was actually a big campaign, too, later on to prevent women from actually working in mines, and then there was the Mines Act of 1842 that prevented children under the age of 10 from working in mines. It's a very, very crazy place to be, and it's something that could very easily kill you, but the way the factory owners looked at it is, we need this stuff, so we're going to send them down there. Getting further into it, Children had some of the worst jobs. Children had some of the most dangerous jobs because they started in the early period working as early as five years old. Children worked the mines hauling carts, opening air vents and ducts. This right here is a picture of children dragging carts full of coal up to the surface. These things weighed a ton, and the way the, the mine owners looked at it is like, oh, kids will go get it. Smaller person, smaller hole I need to dig, right? Really messed up. Super, super messed up. But they're hauling carts, opening vents. They repaired factory machinery. And what I mean by that is they would actually untangle all the like threads as they went into the loom. And if they reached inside of them, because they were, they especially expected to reach in there because their hands were really tiny. But children could be working 12 to 16 hours at the age of five. Now, luckily in 1833, they start making demands being like, if you're under the age of nine, you can no longer work. Uh, and if you're over the age of nine, you're working eight hour shifts where it's like, I don't want my nine-year-old simply working eight hours at all. So as you can see, this is not, it's kind of like an afterthought. If uh, the kids were not being hurt and harmed all the time, they probably never would have gotten rid of child labor in the first place. But as we know, these children are into, subject to very, very dangerous like conditions. These are the, uh, the young girl like sitting there staring at a loom itself. It's very, very awful. Now, there are huge positives to the Industrial Revolution. Some of the biggest positives to the Industrial Revolution is there's more jobs. Jobs are increasing. Wages are going up. People are making more money. Uh, as the years go on and as inflation goes forward, wages do rise. But at one point, they start to kind of stagnate out. And workers are not receiving what many people would believe during this time period to be a fair wage. Costs are going to go down heavily for factory... Oh, hey, buddy. Factory owners, costs are going to go down for them, so it's benefiting the factory owners while at the same time kind of messing the worker up. You're also going to see a positive rise of labor unions. Labor unions are these organizations that fight for the rights of workers. They used to hold big things like strikes or walkouts or protests, and these labor unions would fight for their workers' rights, and they would say, look, children should not be working anymore. And so they passed the mine or the Factories Act of 1833, requiring factories to provide elementary school education to any children who worked there. That's a success of a labor union. So these labor unions in their earliest onset were great. Sometimes in our modern day economy, they have too much power, but that's a debate for another day. Negatives of the Industrial Revolution, people are going to die, terrible working conditions, Pollution. Pollution got so bad in England at one point, actually, that it affected the local wildlife. Like, check this bad boy out. I'm going to pepper moths. So these pepper moths are from the UK. And these stacks, these big, 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 giant uh, factory stacks would pump out coal dust and smoke all the time. Now, these pepper moths right here, as you can see, one is kind of pepper colored, like a little bit of black and white. This one's stark black. So early on... During the 1700s, 
All the pepper moths that look like this survived because they blended in with the tree that they tried to hide on. As you can see, here's a pepper moth trying to blend in with the tree right there. Birds couldn't see them, they would live, nothing would happen to them. But then as the industrial revolution went on and they started burning more coal dust, the trees started getting covered in black coal dust. So the moths that were black started living and the pepper moths, these guys started dying. So the industrial revolution's pollution was actually so bad that it affected natural selection in Darwin's theories of evolution. How crazy is that? That's insane that the pollution got that bad. Also, you were subject to a lot of terrible diseases during this time, cholera being one of the worst. Cholera was usually taken uh, in from infected water that had uh, like fecal matter poop or like bodily fluids from other human beings inside of it. It's this rod shaped uh, bacteria gets inside your system and it causes you to literally go to the bathroom so much that you end up eventually dying. It's a very, very dangerous disease, but it's very, very prominent during the industrial revolution. Now going forward though, as you can see, lots and lots of negatives, lots and lots of positives, uh, pollution being one of the worst, cholera, the spread of disease should also go in your negatives as well. But let's go ahead and bang the rest of this out real quick. Come on. Come on, load up. There we go. Uh, we got to... There it is. So, there's also going to be a rise of two... Of three very new ideologies coming out of this Industrial Revolution as well. Let's really, really quick go ahead and throw up a disclaimer here, though, before someone reads this and thinks Mr. Terry is a commie. into it though. Laissez-faire economics is a big thing that pops up. This is something that Adam Smith himself advocated for, saying that governments need to mind their own business and stay out of the business altogether. Don't pass trade sanctions, don't pass these things. Now a lot of people believe that laissez-faire economics though is just a direct reaction to absolutism because absolutists used to have direct influence over businesses and economics. And look what happened the last time that happened, right? So that's a big thing about the laissez-faire economics. That's a very important word. Go ahead and highlight it. It's definitely going to be in your warm-ups in the future. It's super, super important. Next two, socialism, communism. These two words are oftentimes confused with one another. Socialism is the first one that pops up. Socialism was actually a direct byproduct of the French Revolution itself, but it's going to be directly related, and then it's going to take off during the Industrial Revolution and become very popular. That's a very radical view of society. Socialism is the idea of limiting private property, making it so businesses and the means of production are owned by the workers at large. So instead of my dog right here, Rufio, he's very sleepy, uh, him owning the, the milk bone factory or the doggy treat factory, instead of him being the one that owns it and making all the money off of my labor and my wife's labor and Josie's labor, Josie's my other dog, the poodle, uh, instead of that, it would be more along the lines that Josie, myself, and my wife, we actually have an equal share in this business together. It's a very radical idea, and it kind of flies in the face of a lot of capitalist ideas. And it brings with it great things, it brings with it terrible things. So this society view is that you're getting rid of private ownership, you're planning the economy, and that the government actually has a lot more intervention in the economy to prevent any people from growing hyper-successful while other people's are, people are staying hyper-low. So socialism is a thing that we could talk about all day long. But then you got this guy. You got the growth of this other new idea called communism. Now communism has never been succeeded, or like never been successful. No one is truly a communist, no matter what people say. A lot of people like to run around and be like, oh, those commies over in black. Well, that's not actually true. No pure communism uh, ideology has ever been fully achieved. A lot of people have worked towards it, but 
In the long run, when Russia did it, it was just a totalitarian government and a socialist republic, not necessarily communist. Now, getting into it, though, the Industrial Revolution is the thing that sets up all this stuff. And y'all already just read, wrote most of that stuff right there. So if there's anything you're missing, social ownership, the means of production, redistribution of wealth, self-management of the worker, it's born out of the French Revolution like we were just talking about earlier, but the big one is communism. Now, this idea was invented not by Santa Claus over here, but by a German man by the name of Karl Marx. Now, he's a political theorist, and he believes in this idea known as communism. He's advocating for the two classes to go to war with each other. So his big classes are called the bourgeois, like the ones from France. They're the big business owners. They're the ones putting the workers to work. And then he has another class called the proletariat, who is the working class. And he believes that the bourgeois and the proletariat are one day headed for a collision and they're going to end up going to war no matter what. And a class war is going to break out. And he believes that the proletariat will end up winning due to the fact that they have larger numbers and they are much more angry. And this is going to lead to a society when all property is publicly owned and there no one truly owns anything up outright. And each person is going to work and is going to be paid according to their abilities and needs is a great idea on paper. It's never going to truly work, especially when capitalism gives us a lot of great things like innovations and technological revolutions and the ability to try and fight off diseases and stave off these things. So communism, great idea on paper. Karl Marx, very warm and fuzzy. Not really. But this is the communist symbol. If you could do me a favor, draw that in your notes if you can find it. It's the sickle and the hammer. And the reason why it's a sickle and a hammer is because it's the workers of the factories, the hammer, and the workers of the agricultural system, the sickle, supposed to be uniting together to take the society back, right? And like I said, I do not advocate for either of those. I'm just saying what it is. But Karl Marx wrote all these ideas he had down in this thing called the Communist Manifesto, which we will talk about again later when we actually bring back up Russia. But I'm just letting you know communism was born out of this, right? Rise of a lot of isms during this time period. But we'll talk about some more of those later. I love you guys. You're doing great. Keep up the hard work. We're so proud of you here in the Terry household. But I'll see you guys soon. We're going to have a Google Meet soon so I, we can hang out and talk a little bit. But I'll see you all then. Have a good one.